I want to say one, yeah. Okay. Do the cannon. Yeah, good. Okay, so in this video, we're going to be starting section four. Now, in section three, we looked at control volumes and we figured out how to do mass balances and force balances over the control volumes. But we didn't talk a lot about how do you get the velocity values and how do you get the pressure values. And so in section four now, we're going to be looking at inviscid flows or frictionless flows. And that's going to show us how do we figure out what these pressure value and velocity values are. Uh, and we're also going to be looking at the relationship between pressure and velocity. And specifically in this video, we're going to be looking at what drives flows forward. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section four. It's called incompressible and viscid flow. In this video, we'll talk about what the Navier-Stokes equations are, and then we'll, we'll simplify them for frictionless flow, and we'll get what's called the Euler equations. And then in the example that's connected to this video, we'll use the Euler equation to figure out the flow in a bend. Okay, so in section three, we were analyzing control volumes, and so we described how you need to use integral equations to describe that. And we saw that that type of analysis is really useful for understanding the forces on objects. You know, for example, if you were looking at, you know, a rocket or a race car, or even the wing on a race car, you can figure out all the forces on it with those integral equations. But for example, if you're looking at the wing on a race car, so you can understand all the forces on it, but section three didn't give us the information that described the velocity, right, that's flowing around this wing, or the pressure distribution around this wing that actually generates these forces. So to do that, at the beginning of section three, we talked about how you could use a system approach for that, where essentially you need like the point by point information of the flow. So you're studying the trajectory over time, you're moving with the fluid particles. And we mentioned that that would be not integral equations, but partial differential equations. And so that's really interesting and, and fairly complex. And so we reserve that derivation of those differential equations for upper year courses. So for example, at Ontario Tech, there's a graduate course where we derive all those and work with those and see how to understand the flow by looking at the differential equations. For, for now, for here, I've shown you here the result of this. So these are called the Navier-Stokes equations. And so what they are is they're actually a momentum balance like we did before for except in differential form, so not for a control volume. That figure at the right sort of gives a hint as to how we derive them. And so we're not going to go into that detail here, but instead what we're going to do in section four is start out with these equations and then show how we can make simplifications to them and see how there's still a lot that we can learn about pressures and velocities and how fluids flow by looking at a very simplified form of these equations. And that's what we're going to do here. Okay, so the title, Incompressible and Viscid Flow. So that title there indicates the simplifications we're going to make. So incompressible we've already talked about. It's where the density doesn't change. So things like liquids or gases where we don't have a big change change in temperature. But then in viscid, what does in viscid mean? So we'll come to see through this lecture that what we're referring to there is cases where the viscosity is negligible. Okay, but I think to get an appreciation for what that means and how we apply that, we're going to need to march through this lecture a little bit more. So first I've written out here the Navier-Stokes equations. These are a famous set of equations and basically what they are is a momentum balance or as we've seen roughly interchangeable with a force balance, right? But for the case where we're following a fluid particle as it flows along. And we get a sense for just how complex these equations are. You can see under Navier-Stokes there, I list all the assumptions that have been made to get us even to these equations, which are admittedly quite complex, right? So these fluids have to be Newtonian, has to be incompressible, has to be constant viscosity, etc. So just from what we've learned so far, we take a quick peek at this equation and we just take sort of a rough overview on what's going on here, we can now kind of see, like we're able to dissect a little bit, I hope, the forces that these terms correspond to. So for example, on the right hand side there, we can basically see we have a body force there with the gravity term. We have our surface forces, right? So the pressure and then the viscous forces or the shear forces. So on the right, we have the external forces there, surface forces and body forces. And on the left, we know that's balancing with the rate of change of momentum. So mass times the velocity change. Okay, so a few important notes on this before everybody freaks out. So we're, we're not gonna be dealing with these equations here. Like I said, these, these are for more advanced courses, but it's important for us to understand what they're used for. So you can see if you take a quick look at the variables there, when you solve this equation, I just, I just did air quotes there, but <laughs> when you solve it, you are looking for a velocity field and a pressure field, right? So you can see those are the variables you would solve for. So as I mentioned, when you generally solve this type of equation, what you're doing is trying to figure out 
for some geometry or from for some case that you've set up you want to know what the velocity looks like what does that velocity field look like now there's been a few movies recently where they show some mathematician who's trying to work away on solving some impossible problem and generally in those movies in a few cases what they're trying to solve is the navier stokes equations right so these equations they're trying to find a solution for that's because it's not possible to solve these analytically at the moment so we turn to numerical tools that's things like cfd computational fluid dynamics but the approach we're going to take here in section four is instead we can simplify this so we can take a whole bunch of cases relevant to our engineering practice just by simplifying out one of these terms. So when we say in viscid flow, saying negligible viscosity, we see that viscosity showing up right here. So what it means is we're getting rid of this term here. So this is a vector equation showing x, y, z. So in each of the cases, that's the term we're getting rid of which leaves us with a much more simple equation to solve for. Then I think before we go through this, it's important, right, that we get an understanding of what <laughs> we're engineers. What are we going to be solving for, right? What, what is this useful for? What are the practical applications where we're going to use this? So it's true. You may be thinking, well, when, when is viscosity negligible? Like, does that mean I only deal with fluids that are very thin? They have very low viscosities. Well, we'll see again. It'll become more clear as we march through this, but generally speaking, there, there are many cases where the flow is not influenced by its viscous terms. And this, this is where section five is going to come in. We're going to get a really solid understanding when we look at the dimensionless parameters, exactly how do we quantify how much viscosity or how much certain forces play a role in these equations. So for now, we'll just remember that this is only applicable to these inviscid flows where viscosity is negligible. So in general consideration, that means things where friction doesn't matter all that much. So we don't really have shear playing a role. So we'll park that thought there and know that we're coming back in section five to revisit that again. Okay, so to get Euler's equation, we basically take the Navier-Stokes equation, as I mentioned, and we set the viscosity equal to zero. Once we eliminate that term on the right there that I've shown, we're left with this equation here. And we can see again, by inspection of these three terms. So we basically have the momentum change, mass times acceleration, gravity forces, and then the pressure forces here. So Newton's second law, right? So rate of change of momentum is balanced by all the external forces which are the body and surface forces there. And because there's no viscosity, there are no friction terms. We canceled those off. Okay, when we see the capital D there, the D is referring to a material derivative, and that includes the time and spatial derivatives like this, so we can think of that essentially as just a shortcut to write it with the capital D instead of writing out all those terms that you see below there. And then finally, for these types of flows, we have mass conservation, which simplifies to that expression here, which is applicable, again, only to incompressible flows, and we skip the derivation of that, that's also something that's driving more advanced courses. We have an idea now for how these mass balances work out. Okay, that's a vector equation. So what we'll do is write it out here in the form that we're more likely to use in application. Okay, so that's Euler's equation there. And just one more note on that body force term. Generally, the coordinates can be set up so that the gravity vector is in line with one of the Cartesian directions there, normally z-axis. So if we make the z-axis vertical, then we can ignore the gx and gy terms, and we'd only see g come up in the z expression there, for example. Okay, so now we're going to look at applying Euler's equation in one other way. I'm going to look at the Euler's equation in streamline coordinates. If we talk about streamline coordinates, it's important to understand what streamline direction means. So if you look at the streamlines that are plotted on the right hand side, so streamlines are plotted in blue there. If you take a close look at a little fluid that's flowing along this pathway, we've got a little fluid particle shown in the box there. So the S direction is the direction along the streamline and then n direction denotes normal to the streamline. And we remember that the streamline is defined as tangent to the flow. So if we're traveling with this particle, the direction along the streamline then is the direction the particle is flowing. Okay, so we can take those equations above and write them instead in the streamline direction. So the full equation looks like this. But what we're gonna do with this equation here is really break out an understanding of how pressure and velocity relate. So we're gonna go ahead and neglect gravity in this case and look at only steady case flows. So it simplifies to the line below. Likewise, for the normal direction, we'll take those differential equations above, convert them into this new coordinate system with the S and the N. So we have that top equation there. 
we neglect gravity again, and we're left with this. Okay, now here's where we have to pause, and, and this is where some of the most important core engineering principles that we're gonna see in this entire course, these are gonna come out right now by looking at these two equations here. So I don't think I can emphasize that strongly enough. When we look at Euler's equation here, it really gives us a deep understanding of the flow. So when we look at the streamlined direction, let's pause for a moment, and I, I want you to look at that and so for real, pause the video here. I, I really want to emphasize, I want you to stop and look at that and just see if you can understand exactly what this equation is telling you. There's only two terms there, right? So stop and understand that before I go ahead and tell you what that means. Make sure you look at that and you understand what that's saying. Okay, so this is in the streamline direction, so along a streamline. So I'm gonna look at one of these streamlines at the right here and imagine we're a particle traveling along that streamline. So that's our motion there. So what this is telling us is it's saying the term on the left there is what? So the change in pressure in the S direction, di P di S, right? So that's the change in pressure along the streamline. And what is the term on the right? Well, that's di V di S. So that's basically just saying the acceleration or the change in velocity along the streamline. But there's a negative sign there, right? So what exactly does that mean physically? That's telling us the term on the left, okay, if the pressure change along the streamline is positive, meaning pressure increases as we travel along this streamline, so as I'm traveling from here to here, as I move along, if that term on the left is positive, so if I'm flowing into an increased pressure, therefore the term on the right will have the same magnitude but be negative, so it means my velocity decreases in the S direction. So we see that, so as I flow along, if I flow into a zone where the pressure is getting higher, so I'm flowing towards a higher pressure, my velocity is going down. So as you flow into a high pressure zone, you decelerate, right? But conversely, if dPDS is negative value, so it means you're flowing from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone, so flowing into a low pressure zone means you accelerate, which is the basics for how we drive these flows. So as you put a pump in a flow, you generate a high pressure, so you're causing the fluid to flow from a high pressure zone towards a low pressure zone, meaning you're accelerating that fluid. That's what generates flow. Okay, now what are these normal, the two terms in the normal direction here? Basically, pressure gradient in the normal direction, and then on the right-hand side, we have velocity, and R is curvature, we see from the figure there. So it's kind of like centripetal acceleration, right? So what's that that's telling us is if we have a curved streamline, the pressure increases in the direction positive to the normal force. So the pressure increases in the outward direction from the curvature. But if we remember, we see how the curvature is defined there. So if we have a straight streamline, what does that mean for the curvature? What's the R value there? If the line is straight, that indicates a curvature value of infinity. So I'll give you a second to take a look at the figure there. Remember back to physics, you would have seen some curvature problems in physics. So if R is infinity, the term on the right goes to zero, meaning you can only have a change in pressure in the normal direction to the flow when you have curved streamlines. If you have straight streamlines, no way can you have a pressure variation normal to your streamlines. This is very, very important for engineering design questions. Straight streamlines, no pressure variation normal to the streamlines. That's also a great exam question, right? As I mentioned before, it's really important that you do self-initiated note-taking, right? So hopefully you had some sort of summary that was similar to that that you wrote yourself as I was talking there. It's a good idea to do that throughout the lectures and I'll just only do the extremely important things I'll put notes for. Okay, so in summary, we started by looking at the Navier-Stokes equations and that's a momentum balance in differential form. Now we didn't derive it because that's done in more advanced courses, but what those differential equations do is because they're essentially following along with the flow is we get information about the velocity and the pressure of these flows. So in section four, we took that fairly complex differential equation, simplified it by making a few assumptions. So we looked at incompressible flows and inviscid flows, which essentially means frictionless flows. And the simplification led us to Euler's equation. And then what Euler's equation helped us understand, we looked at it in streamline coordinates so we could understand that we can use pressures to drive fluid flows. So by causing a fluid to flow from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone, that's how we drive that flow forward. That's how we accelerate that flow. And that's why we use pumps in flows. So pumps raise the pressure, causing fluid 
fluids to flow from these high pressure zones towards lower pressure zones. They accelerate towards that. Okay, now there's an example following this that's connected with this. We're going to look at how you would use that equation to get flow in a bend. In the next video, we're going to go on and look at Bernoulli's equation, which is a really important way to understand the relationship between velocity and pressure. We use that a lot in thinking about designs related to fluid mechanics, like race cars, for example. Okay, and that's all for video number 10. Bye-bye.